All right, here we go, guys. We got questions 21 through 25 here. Um, this question, they give us an exponential function, and they're asking, based off of this graph, which statement is true about the function. Notice all these here are talking about the domain and range. All right, so domain, that's the set of all your x values. So then, obviously, the range, and I'll use an R for that, is all of your y values. All right, and depending on how it's drawn, if it's continuous or a discrete graph, if it's a discrete uh, graph with individual points not connected, usually you put your domain and range in these little brackets, these little fancy brackets, and you just list out the numbers individually. Otherwise, you would write it as an inequality if it's continuous. So you got a continuous line right there. So we're going to write it either as an inequality or, you know, they write it out verbally here on these. So our domain values, all of your x values, basically that's asking how far to the right and how far to the left does this graph go. Now, they have arrows drawn at the end, so that means it keeps going, for example, it keeps going right forever, and it's kind of going up and diagonal to the left, so that means it actually technically goes left forever. So we're going to say for our domain, any x value works there, so we'll say all real numbers. <coughs> Uh, some of your teachers might have taught you from negative infinity to positive infinity uh, if it keeps going on forever. So something that kind of looks like that. But our range value, this is a little bit different here because it eventually levels off here. So our range values is how high and how low does the graph go. I guess I need to draw the arrows kind of like this here. So looking at how high and how low. Now it keeps going up forever, but it eventually levels off here at your x-axis. So we're going to say our x values, or actually I'm sorry, my y values, my y values are going to be greater than zero. All right, and the reason we don't put the equal to, um, we don't write it as greater than or equal to is because eventually it, it levels off at zero, but it has this thing called a horizontal asymptote, and that means the line never crosses uh, your x-axis there, and that's one of the properties of exponential functions right there. So we need to go and find something here where it says the range is greater than zero or the domain is all numbers here. Um, so both the domains are wrong here. It says, um, you know, for B and D, the set of all real numbers greater than negative four or less than negative four. So those definitely aren't correct because we said the domain is everything, all the real numbers there. So then you also got one here where it's the range is the set of all numbers less than zero and then the set that is greater than zero, and that's what we wrote our range as. So that's probably going to be our best option on that one. So that's a little quick review of domain and range. Let's see here what we got. The sum of the first n consecutive even numbers can be found by using this equation right here. The sum equals n squared plus n, where n must be greater than or equal to two. That doesn't really mean a whole lot. It just means, well, of course, you got to you know start with a number that's you know an even number, so it's got to start at two and then greater. Uh, for what value of n, what is the value of n when the sum is 156? So I'm going to plug that in to the equation. Now i got a quadratic to solve here. Okay, now um, since we're saying n is consecutive even numbers right there, hopefully you can eliminate answer g, right? Because obviously it's got to be some type of even number. So that might help you out. Really, it's not going to help us out too much here in this case. But what I'm going to wind up doing here, there's multiple ways you can solve a quadratic, and that's when you have an n squared and an n, or an x squared and an x. Right? So one of the ways that we commonly do is factoring. All right, And you have to make sure that's equal to 0, and that's actually how we're going to solve. I'm going to back up my answer by doing graphing here in a second. And when you're doing graphing, you need to look for your x-intercepts. Um, another way you can do it is complete the square. And that's kind of one of the newer things that we are teaching in Algebra 1. So you may be familiar with that, maybe not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, another common one is the quadratic formula which that should be on your formula chart. That's like the negative b plus minus square root, b squared minus 4ac. It's a big, long formula. 
So that one kind of takes a long time. So usually I choose one of these two right here. And honestly, I'd probably go graphing first, but I want to show you multiple ways on how to do this problem. Now, uh, no matter which way you're doing it, factoring or graphing, you need to have this thing set equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract 156 from both sides. Okay, so then we need to go and find some numbers here that are going to multiply to negative 156. This is kind of my visual thing that I draw to help myself self out. And then add up to um, positive 1 there. And I believe that should be... Let me double check here. I think we're going to go 12 and something here. I'm pulling up my calculator. Oh, now my phone's trying to do something weird here. So we'll go 156. I think it's divided by 12. Yeah, so 12. Uh, so it's going to wind up being 12 and 13 for those factors there that work out. And then you need to make sure it adds the positive 1. So I'm going to make it negative 12. So I'm going to write this as n minus 12 and then n plus 13. Okay, this thing over here to the left, just in case you're not, you know, at Flower Mount High School or something, that's kind of what we draw to, uh, you know, it's just a visual thing where we put all of our numbers. you got to ask yourself what multiplies to this top number and adds to the bottom number. So negative 12, 13, that works out. Now, all of this is set equal to zero. Your zero product property says if you have two things that are multiplied together that equals zero, one of those pieces has to be equal to zero. So what does that mean? That means... You can essentially split these up into two different cases and solve them out. So positive 12 would be an answer, negative 13 would be another answer. Now the best answer in this situation, we're talking about numbers greater than or equal to 2. They need to be even, and we're assuming not negative, I guess. So we need to go with 12, that's probably the best answer, so that would be J. Okay, so uh, let me show you here, uh, in my opinion, a better way actually to solve this equation here. So I'm going to go into the Desimos test mode. So one of the ways we can solve is by setting the graph. We uh, solve it, set it equal to zero, and whatever's on that left or right hand side, we're going to type that into our graphing calculator, x squared, and then we're going to go, uh, what was it, plus x, and then minus 156. Now I'm going to zoom out here a little bit, and we're looking for when the graph is equal to zero, when the y values are equal to zero right there. So you got negative 13 and 12. In my opinion, that's a little bit quicker, so I would probably go with that. Uh, you can also do this on the TI-84 graphing calculators, or TI-83 actually you can do them on those as well. So that's just one uh, another way to do that type of problem there. So I don't know, kind of handy sometimes, uh, multiple ways. All right, next one here, what do we got? Which graph represents negative 3x plus 5y equals negative 15? It's kind of multiple ways you can go graph this thing. Uh, one technique is you could go find your x and y intercepts and then just figure out which one of these graphs match up with that. Usually I teach my students to solve this thing for y. You can also use Desmos. I'll show you how Desmos is really easy with this one as well. But uh, this one's not too bad to do by hand, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. We're going to get y by itself. The reason we're getting y by itself is when y is by itself, it's in the format y equals mx plus b. So then I can go and you know rock my slope and then uh, you know take care of my y-intercept as well and figure out which graph matches the best. So that's going to give us 5y, 3x, and negative 15. Those are not like terms, so I can't really you know combine those in any way except just writing them side by side. We're going to divide by 5 to get y truly by itself. So we'll say it's got a slope of 3 fifths, 3 fifths x, and then minus 3. So right away I know this graph, it's, um, it's got a negative y-intercept, it's got a positive slope, so you could probably use that to narrow down a couple answers. Uh, I'm thinking b is looking like the best one here, because it's got a y-intercept of negative 3, and then it does go up 5 and then over 3. So answer b is going to be our best option. Now, once again, Desmos, what I like about it, uh, if we want to graph things, we don't even need to solve for y or solve for x or any of that jazz there. So I'm going to go to Desmos. I'm going to type in that equation. 
Let's see if I can remember it here. So I close up my notes. I think it was negative 3x. Oh, whoops. And I'm not even typing it right. Negative 3x. And then I get, I think we have plus 5y. And then equals, I think it was negative uh, 15. Yep, there we go. And then there's your graph. Whoops. Trying to just regular zoom in there. And then there's those intercepts there that we saw. We see that it goes up three and then over five eventually, so that one matches up. So that's how you could quickly, once again, use Desmos. It's very, very helpful. And I guess that's trying to reload here. All right. Uh, I got a couple more here. The graph of uh, y equals x squared. Or it doesn't say y equals, but another thing, this is function notation. If you want to just write this as y equals x squared, it's the same thing. That's shown down below. All right, which statement is true about between the graph of f and the graph of gx, where you change that um, thing out in front of x squared, you change it to 7x squared. So that kind of changes the way you know this one works out. It winds up kind of looking like this right here. Oh, it's trying to do a straight line. I don't want to do a straight line. There we go. Kind of looks like this right here. Honestly, I type this into a graphing calculator, or I would type this into Desmos to see what the graphs look like. And uh, just so I don't have to back out of there, kind of take my word for it. That's what the graph should look like, uh, which is going to make the graph narrower. So make sure I select the right one. Graph of G is narrower than the graph of F. It doesn't affect how high or how low the graph is. Usually, these are kind of written in this format here where it's like ax squared and then plus c. That's kind of like your general format. The a, if it's uh, if it gets bigger, then you got a narrower graph. And then if, a, if the a value gets smaller, it's a wider now we'll see another example here shortly. If a goes, or if the c value goes up, that uh, it's a vertical translation. And I usually just write the word shift, so that means shift up. If the c is going down, so like a uh, you know negative ten for c, that's moving the graph uh, the graph down. So that's a quick recap on that. But honestly, type in your graphic calculator, look at the graphs, use your graph interpretation, and figure out which one of those is happening. Our last one here, which expression is a factor of 36x squared minus 49? Really, it's just asking what two binomials multiply into this binomial up here. Or not a binomial, into that, um, into that um, well, I guess technically binomial. But um, anyways, so we're trying to figure out what times what gets us 36x squared. This is a specific case. It's called a difference. Oops. Difference of squares. All right, and a quick way to do these here, you're trying to figure out what foils into this thing or what multiplies, double distribute, whatever you want to call it, into all this here. So we can say 6x times 6x gets us 36x squared. And then we can say negative 7 and positive 7 get us that 49. Essentially, you're taking the uh, square roots of both of these numbers and then one of them's got a plus and one of them's got a minus right there all right um, so you have two different factors 6x minus 7 6x plus 7 so it's just saying which one of them is one of the factors so I guess answer D is probably the best answer choice there all right and that's uh, yeah that's about it there and actually on your Formula chart for the star, they give you the difference of squares pattern here. They kind of say this right here, a squared minus b squared. Looks like this. You just square root them both. You say a, b, a, b. One's got a minus, one's got a plus. And that's on the formula chart right there. So that's how I got that. So anyways, there you go.